it is a joy and a pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, for some reason, just remind you, I'm writing a new book. And it's called The Death of Santini, where I'm writing about my father's dying. And I'm writing especially about my father's change that he made after the publication of the great Santini, a book he hated, a book he loathed. That book my mother gave to the judge at their divorce trial. <laughs> and my mother said, Your Honor, it's all here. You do not need to call a single witness. <laughs> um, people think I exaggerate. Uh, my family, I mean, the critics in New York and LA, I mean, they, and hey, gang, I'm not going to fool you. We're Southern, right? <laughs> and I don't have to fool y'all. I had a sign at Rich's department store when the Prince of Tides came out. And, you know, I, I was born in Georgia, so we know the Georgia thing. So I was in there, and this beautiful couple, yeah, you Georgia girls are good looking. You Georgia boys are good looking. Good looking couple. So University of Georgia, I said, what fraternity are you in? So I was president of KA. What sorority are you in? I was president of Tridelt. <laughs> and so we're sitting there talking, and the guy from KA looks at me, and he says, Boy, your family's nuts, aren't they? <laughs> and I said, yeah, they are. How's your family, pal? <laughs> and he said, oh, my family's great. They're wonderful, distinguished, long history. I said, OK, now that we're being honest. How far do I got to go till I hit the first nutcase in your house? <laughs> And you all can apply the same to yourselves, okay? This is, it's, it's an international game. And in the South, believe me, it ain't far. <laughs> so I said, Mama, Daddy, Brother, Sister, Aunt, Uncle, the Tridel broke. <laughs> the Tridel says, his mother's nuts! <laughs> And I think it is an internet. Now, let me tell you, I'm writing a book, too, and I've had to go back into my southern roots that my mother simply denied her entire life. And I couldn't write the book if mom was alive. I can tell you. Uh, I just could not do it. Because I found out little things like this. I went to visit my great uncle in the federal penitentiary of Atlanta in 1973 when I moved to Atlanta. So I said, Uncle Joe. What you in for? He said, bad, bad habit, shoplifting. He had murdered my other great uncle. <laughs> my grandmother, Stanny's brother. Okay, do this, yes, okay? For the outside. All right, excuse me, gang. Outside, can you hear? All right. <clears throat> this is, um, I'm so sorry, I would have ran my mouth louder had I known him. But my mother's family, um, we had this when mom was dying. She had me go back to Rome, Georgia. And she married a new guy, a guy from New York, a Boston doctor, Dr. John Egan. My mother wanted me to call him Dr. John. I said, Mom, I'm an adult. I'm not calling him Dr. John, OK? <laughs> so anyway, she asked me, she is dying in the hospital in Augusta. And she asked me, she said, son, will you do me a favor? I was just telling John that we come from one of the largest plantation-owning families in Alabama history. <laughs> I said, oh, really, Mom? <laughs> and the plantation spread from the Chattahoochee River all the way over to the end of the Western Alabama line. And we were wealthy and aristocratic beyond human belief. I said, that's great, Mom. That's really a surprise to me. <laughs> and could you tell me what happened to this fabulous aristocratic family? And my mother sadly says, the woe. <laughs> I said, the woe? 
She said, well, whoa. They took all our plantations. They took all, everything we had, we were left penniless. I said, okay, I'll go with that. The whoa, it was awful. <laughs> what happened to those poor people after that? She said, the depression. The depression. And Dr. John says, oh my God, these young people, they don't know the depression or what it did. The I said, the depression sure must have been horrible, Mom. And it took whatever we had left. I said, okay, Mom, now answer me this question. After the depression, why couldn't any of them read? <laughs> the woe, the depression, I want to know why they were all illiterate. So my mother, you know, she's just, you know, could not accept it, uh, could not believe it. I have, what I have found, she would go nuts over. She would never speak to me again. Um, my great-grandmother in Piedmont, Alabama, shot my great-grandfather out of his wheelchair <laughs> at the top of the stairs of their house that is still called Nolan Hill. His son took the rap for the mother, and the son went to prison. Now, I could tell this story up north a million times, and people just look at me like I'm nuts. <laughs> but I'm telling it down here in Social Service. <laughs> and you and I could play dueling families together all, all night long, and y'all would win a lot of the encounters. <laughs> Let me start how I did when I first started as a writer. By the way, at the end of this month, 26th of October, I will be turning 65 years old, which is a... <clears throat> Why do I still feel like I'm 18? I cannot figure this out. I don't feel like I'm 18. But it is amazing to me, the passage of time seems to be the only extraordinary surprise you get in your life. It's as fast as they said it would be. And you know, I, I can close my eyes, I still see my mother. Beautiful. See my dad, the fire pilot. Tough. Um, but here's how I used to start out when I was trying to explain. When I first talked in New York, I want to explain where I came from to them. And I could tell they didn't quite understand it, but you all will. My mother used to say this about Southern literature. She raised me to be a Southern writer. And she said, all Southern literature can be summed up in this sentence. On the night the hogs ate Willie, <laughs> mama died when she heard what daddy did to sister. <laughs> And I thought, I said this in New York, and he looked at me like I was nuts. <laughs> looked at me like I was completely out of my mind. So then I started saying, let me tell you about the difference between my mother's family from Alabama in Rome, Georgia, and my father's family, Irish Catholic from Chicago. My father thought my mother's relatives were the biggest hicks, the biggest dopes he had ever met in his entire life. Here's the names of my mother's family. Don't you love playing Southern name games? <laughs> my mother's family, there was my grandfather, Jasper Catlett, his brother Cicero. There was Clyde, Pluma, AC Lucy. There was, what were some of those? A Vashti, Talitha. These names would go through. And we would always clean graves once a year. We'd go to Piedmont, we'd clean up the graves and you know, do that. And my family was a fanatic on this. I was going around one grave with my grandmother, Stanny. And I said, who's this, Stanny? And she said, oh, oh, he was my, um, he was my uncle, Pat. And I said, well, his name, Jerry Meyer, M-I-R-E, Jerry Meyer Peak. Who's he named after? And my grandmother said, he's named after the prophet. Jerry Meyer. 
again, this New York audience stares at me like I did not deserve to be allowed in the city limits. But my father, he thought these names were silly. He said, you know, holy God, Peg. You know, we're not gonna name our kids anything like that. All right, dad names all the seven children. Now, of course, I must tell you, Roman Catholic, there were also six miscarriages. And my sister thought, and she called the miscarriages the lucky ones. <laughs> the ones that not have to be born in our brutal, violent household. And she thought that somehow they heard what was going on in the outside world and just said, no way, man, I ain't getting into that. <laughs> we, we come into dad naming the children. He had seven of us that survived, if you call this survival. Here they are, me, Pat, Carol, Mike, Kathy, Jim, Tim, Tom. <laughs> With that list, you get everything you need to know about the creativity of the Irish landing in America. <laughs> Every this way, there was another story I told, trying to get, trying to make some connection to these people, just trying to, anything. And I had just been to something all of you have been to many times. It was the first Georgia football game, where the gathering of the masses that takes place around the state. And I had never been to this church. I've been, my mother was in love with a guy named, um, what was that guy's name? Georgia Tech. He was a famous back. Clint Castleberry, I think was his name. And my mother talked about Clint Castleberry. I wish he was my dad my entire childhood. But I've been to a lot of tech games, but never been to the University of Georgia game. They were playing Tennessee, and the guy that lived next door was a fanatic Tennessee fan. So he takes me up there, and Knox and I goes up to this game. We sit there, and all of you all know this scene. You, know, you, know, you know that he, tailgate, you know, everything. And it was classic University of Georgia afternoon. So we get up there, nice seats, and we're sitting there in Knox Dobbins, and I'd live next door, and it was, you know, a great weekend out. The game begins, the kickoff. The Bulldogs kicked off to the volunteers, and the woman right next to me begins this. Oh! And every once in a while she'd pause to take a drink of what looked like brown fluid. <laughs> and she would say, oh, oh, let the big dog eat. <laughs> and then she would continue. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, Conroy can take very little of this for very long. I like football. Madam. Are you going to bark during this whole game? Because <laughs> I'm about to throw you through a plate glass window, you know, and shut this up. I bet you're from Tennessee, aren't you? <laughs> and I said, I want to be now. <laughs> she did the whole, I couldn't believe it, for the whole half. Ar, ar. I was being driven crazy. Okay, it's the end of the half. Ar, she stops at halftime. I thought she was going to go right through. And so she turns, and now she's going, you know, she's you know, a southern girl, out for a good time. And she turns to see who we were. And she says, where are you from, boy? And I said, I'm from Beaufort, South Carolina. And she said, I love Beaufort, South Carolina. I've been to Beaufort, South Carolina. You know what I love best about Beaufort? I said, I can't wait to hear. <laughs> she said, I love to get drunk in Beaufort. <laughs> she asked my friend, Knox Dobbins. Oh, uh, who are you? Where are you from? from he's from Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, no, Knoxville, I'm sorry. That's, you know, he would kill me. And he's from Knoxville, Tennessee. And she said, Knoxville, Tennessee. I was there last year. You know, I love that Knoxville, Tennessee. What? I love getting drunk in Knoxville, Tennessee. <laughs> Finally, there's a woman. We have no idea. A young woman. 
who's one thing, says, honey, where are you from? And she said, I'm from Valdosta, Georgia. My God, I love Valdosta, Georgia. You know I love Valdosta, Georgia? And no, I don't know. He says, I love your damn onions. <laughs> I told that story in New York City. <laughs> and there was not even a grin in the room. <laughs> not even a grin. I told this story last night. In writing this book, um, I've got had this wild best friend in Beaufort, South Carolina, Bernie Shine. And Bernie and I have been best friends since high school. And he is outrageous. There's only one or two stories about Bernie I can actually tell a group of civilized human beings. <laughs> and they are unbelievable. But Bernie comes in this book because my grandmother, he used to take, I quit taking my grandmother to cemeteries when she moved to Atlanta to be near me. I said, hey, will you take me to see the relatives? No, I won't, Sandy. But Pat, I love our relatives. I said, good, I'm glad you love them. You, you hitchhike out there. See them. I ain't going with you again. Why? I said, because it, we went five times last week, Cindy. And I don't care to see them. I don't care when you talk to them. I ain't going. She called Bernie. Bernie, when he gets back, Sandy had no idea where anybody was buried. And Bernie took her on his back walked her, <laughs> he said, I walked her for miles in that cemetery. We finally, he said, I lied to her and said, yeah, we finally found Uncle James. <laughs> and I let Stanley down, I said, I'm exhausted. I collapsed to the ground. And Stanley says, hello, James, how you doing? And Bernie says, I'm dead, Stanley, how you doing? <laughs> and then he said, Stanley said, now James, you, you say hi to Jesus, right? And you just say hi to Jesus. And Bernie said, I said, you know, I'll tell him, Sandy. You know, I'm just going to see him tonight. We're going to see each other. And they would have these dialogues that I'm going to be writing about. They were amazing, you know, involved in this stuff. But Bernie it will always be mad with me for something I did to him. But I feel badly about this. We were teaching together in Buford High School the year before I went to DeFosky and ruined my entire life and never taught again. And uh, it was, uh, but Bernie came up to me and he said, Pat, could you do me a favor? You teach at the high school. He was principal of an elementary school in town. He said, I've never known if I was smart or not. And you have access to the permanent records of graduates of Buford High School. Could you just bring me my permanent record Totally illegal, of course, but I was 21. And give it to me, and let me look up my IQ, because that'll t give me at least a, you know, a hint, an example of whether I'm smart or not. But Bernie, no problem. I go in, get Bernie's permanent record, open it up, look at his IQ, and I believe it was 135. Good, really good one. But I have an idea. <laughs> So since I give my kids and place their IQs into these permanent records, I take Bernie's 135 IQ up and I and throw it over my head. And then I look for a new IQ for Bernie Shine, my best friend. I select a 69. <laughs> I put it in, mess it up. So poor Bernie, you know, I take it to a party that not everybody knows what I've done. The trick is known, and we were a party, we were dancing, having fun. But when I walked in and threw Bernie his permanent record, everybody knew what was happening. So Bernie opens up, he, I think he would have gotten it, but he, there was a librarian who hated Bernie's guts and tried to kick, get him kicked out of school, wrote long handwritten letters to the principal. And Bernie's going, she's still alive. <laughs> if her house burns down tomorrow, they'll never be able to trace it to these letters. So he got, he got carried away with that. Finally, 
we're all dancing. We were young. And finally Bernie gets to his IQ. And he looked like he'd been shot in the foot. <laughs> I'd never seen such a stricken look on a human being's face in my life. And I started feeling badly about what I'd done, but you know, it was done. So finally the record machine goes off and George Garvey, my friend with a great southern accent, says, Bernie, you look like you've seen a ghost, boy. <laughs> Bernie looks up to the whole party and says, I'm an idiot. <laughs> I'm a complete idiot. <laughs> but then he rallies and he says, you know, I've gone further with a 69 IQ <laughs> than anybody in American history. <laughs> so he rallies, Bernie rallies instantly and says, you know, I should write this up. This is absolutely extraordinary. <laughs> a principal of an elementary school and George Garvey says, now just make your school look bad, Bernie. <laughs> so Bernie, to make up for this, applies to Harvard School of Education to get a master's degree. <laughs> Miraculously, he gets in. He goes up there. And his two years at Harvard changed our lives forever. First year he's up there, he calls me up on the phone and says, Pat, I've talked to everybody. I've met them all, law school, med school, undergraduate, women, men, everybody. I got something to tell you you ain't gonna believe. I said, what's that, Bernie? He said, Pat, we're smarter than these people. <laughs> I said, come on, Bernie, give me a break. He said, no, no, I'm telling you, we're smarter. And we got a lot better personalities, pal. <laughs> I don't know how any of these guys get dates. <laughs> now, Bernie did well up there, graduated. Here's why he gets a man. I did not tell him about the trick for five years. <laughs> I know, <laughs> poor woman's collapsing in my cruelty. <laughs> I forgot, you know, other things were going on. <laughs> Bernie's thesis at Harvard was why an IQ test has nothing to do with human intelligence <laughs> at all. <laughs> when he found out what I had done, he was, he was slightly miffed, I must tell you. He was slightly irritated. But, you know, I thought he'd gotten over it, but he, he, he planned revenge. He told me that. My revenge, when it comes, it will be horrible. In 1976, the great Santini came out. And I think it sold 5,000 5, copies, including intergalactic sales. <laughs> Not much happened to it at all, but you know, I was happy. I'd read a novel. I was proud. So, I get a letter from Jimmy Carter, who was in the White House. And so I opened the letter, thinking, my life has changed. Presidents are now writing me at my home. <laughs> and it was on White House stationery. Dear Pat, Rosalind and I have been reading your book out loud at night before we go to bed. Not since I read Herman Melville at the Naval Academy have I been so moved by a book. So I am strutting around the house. Oh, yeah, yeah. And we'd like you to come up to the White House where we will throw you a dinner party uh, with the luminaries of our time in attendance. <laughs> so I'm going, well, I'll probably have an ambassadorship to a small country. <laughs> and, you know, and I'm going around, I'm having a ball. And I'm thinking, this is great. My life is about to change. So I called the number at the White House from the station, tell them who I was. They put me on hold for an hour. <laughs> And finally, the Secret Service guy comes on. And Jimmy Carter's never heard of me, my novel. Uh, never heard of the great Santini. And he, would, he and the Secret Service would like to know about my fixation on the press. <laughs> so I tell this, what to me was a, you know interesting story at a party in Atlanta. Well, Bernie hears me tell it, and he says, Pat, what, a, what an egomaniac you've turned into. What a pure narcissist. He said, 
I wrote that letter. <laughs> and he said, why would the President of the United States read a book no one else in America has even touched? <laughs> and he said, why would a President of the United States dealing with, you know, matters like nuclear disarmament, war with Iran, why would he be interested in reading a loser's book from Atlanta, Georgia? I just don't understand, you know, where this ego came in. Bernie, I deserve this. I understand this. I deserve it. I understand why you're doing it. I am man enough to admit I earn this award. He did it about every three years. <laughs> And it was enough time for me, to, he did it with Robert Redford, you know, when I was at the University of Colorado. Oh, thank you. University of Colorado, you know, and I read Saul Bellow, Have I Been So Moved by Lords of Discipline? I call out to Wildwood Studios. Robert Redford's never heard of me, never heard of Lords of Discipline. And I thought, you know, there'll be many actresses in my life. It'll be fabulous. This will be wonderful. Bob. Who'd you give me to date tonight? I mean, and you think of it as a novelist. You, you just have all this stuff. Well, here's where the Bernard really got me. The Prince of Times came out in 1986, and it is the first book that actually sold to real human beings. You know, there was, I actually, you know, had a lot of people coming to that. So I'm in the hotel in Seattle, Washington, and I come back from a signing. And there's a note, and it says, please call Barbara Streisand. <laughs> and I said, hey, Bernie, Conroy ain't got no 69 IQ. <laughs> Portland, Oregon, call Barbara Streisand. <laughs> In Chicago, I answer the telephone. And there's an angry voice on the other end. Why haven't you called me back? This is Barbara Streisand. <laughs> Not bad, Bernie. <laughs> I didn't know you could talk like a girl. <laughs> talk like a girl, you're the rudest person I've ever met. Everybody returns my phone calls, pal. I heard a little about Brooklyn more than Beaufort, South Carolina. Are you really Barbara Streisand? Who the hell do you think I am? I said, prove it. Sing the first line of people. I grovelingly apologize. <laughs> and I must now tell you about my friend, Bernie Shine. <laughs> Bernie Shine. When my mother was dying, um, the leukemia that would kill her. Okay, now here is my status in my family. Every time mom had chemotherapy, I would go to be with mom. Because as my brother says, Pat, you're the only one that doesn't have a job. And so I'd go out to be with mom. And all of us in this room have been through this or will go through it. Uh, we, we all know that now. And mom did not handle the chemotherapy well at all. My father took it like he was taking cough syrup. No symptoms, nothing. Mom, it almost killed her every time she did it. And I would go up and be with her and I'd read to her, but. It, the last time, it was just awful. And there was one night, I've, I've talked about this for a long time. This one night, mom was projectile vomiting, uh, horrible diarrhea, and we were in agony in extremis for about three or four hours in the middle of the night. By then I'd learned, I'd become a pretty good nurse where I'd learned to clean, clean up fast, clean up well, get things you know, out of there, get things fixed up. But this night, I lost control. This was a terrible night. 
the wigs I bought my mother had all fallen off. You know, I was covered with everything, mom was covered with everything. At the end of it, I just took mom, stripped her naked, stripped myself naked, and got in the shower with her. And she said, you shouldn't do this, son. You shouldn't, you know, you should leave me some dignity. I said, mom, dignity tonight? And my mother laughed. And she knew. So I showered mom, showered me, cleaned us off, towered us off, got her back in her nightgown, uh, changed her bed, did everything well. And then, you know, I was exhausted. And I was sleeping in the room with her. And I looked over at my mother. Um, I put the wig back on, but it slipped off. And, uh, and mom was so pretty, I'm telling you. Mom was a pretty woman. So in this night of agony, I looked over and the moon was coming in. I saw mom looking out of that. I said, you okay, mama? She said, tell me something, son. Are you writing about me in this new book, Prince of Times? I said, no, mama, I'm not. I'm writing about a family of Eskimos <laughs> who live in the polar ice cap and they eat whale blubber and walrus meat. You're lying. I said, how do you know? She says, I'm your mama. I always knew when you were lying. I said, yeah, I am right about you. But I'm worried, deeply worried, what you're saying about me. And I just want to ask you one thing. One thing I want you to promise. And I said, Mama. And I walked up to her bed, held her hand, kissed her on the cheek, and I said, Darling, you are in a great position to bargain. What do you want? She said, I want you to make me beautiful. I don't want you to write about me like this. I said, Mama because you made me love writing, read to me every night of my childhood, brought me to books, raised me to be a Southern writer with an emphasis on the word Southern. Because of all of this, Mama, I can lift you off this bed, make you so beautiful, send you singing and dancing on a Southern road, and I can do it as well as anybody that ever lived. And I promise I'll do that for you. And my mother said, I would like Meryl Streep to play the role. <laughs> we, I took mom home the last time, for the last time. And I think subconsciously, this was too hard for me, but I think subconsciously she and I both knew she would die. And she died at 59, which now seems like a teenager to me. And so we're going home. I, what I used to do when I took her home, I'd always go either to Charleston or Buford and take her to a great restaurant. She couldn't eat anything because of the chemo. But I'd order escargot and I'd order, you know, oysters with caviar. And, you know, and she loved me ordering. I always ordered her a $100 bottle of wine. She loved that. Oh, Dr. John loved this. And, you know, we, so a little game we played. Well, one day we were sitting in a restaurant, and my mother was always a socially hurt woman. Um, uh, she never got over this childhood. She simply lied about it. And she lied about the mountain people she came from. She lied her whole life about it. And, you know, I could feel her hurt her whole life. Well, mom made a mistake bad social mistake. She tried to get into a ladies club, which was an intellectual club, that required a college degree. Easy for mom. Agnes Scott. She graduated from Agnes Scott, summa cum laude. I'm not sure mom ever passed Agnes Scott <laughs> in a car. I just don't know. I know she didn't go there. And the club found out she didn't go there when they asked for her records. 
at Agnes Scott, and they found out she'd never been in attendance. Okay, her mom said, all right, we're eating this dinner, this last meal I would ever have in a restaurant with my mother. The club walks in the restaurant. And they look at my mother, and none of them talk to her. They ignore her. They didn't talk to me either, but there were reasons in Buford not to talk to me. They were very, you know, reasonable. <laughs> so we left that day. And my mother started crying harder than I've ever heard her cry. Just, she went apart, came apart, weeping uncontrollably. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So I said, Mom, those women back there, would you like me to go back and throw them through a plate glass window? <laughs> my mother crying, she said, you're just like your father, a beast. <laughs> So I said, Mom, I want to thank you for marrying that guy. You know, I did get a, I did get a large part of his DNA, and I have you to thank for that, but okay. Then I said, Mama, she's still crying. Would you, I put all those women that just insulted you, they're all in my book, Prince of Tides. <laughs> and my mother said, she stopped crying. She looked at me and she said, will they recognize themselves? I said, carriage drivers will be driving down Bay Street and they'll point them out going in the store. And my mother said, you're just like me. When Dan died, my sister Carol came down. All the kids came. We were taking six hour shifts with dad. We wanted to send him out well, like we did our mother. Family got together. My sister Carol, the poet in Prince of Tides. I go when she is taking care of my father. I'm relieving her on a six hour shift. And my sister Carol, I hear her screaming at my father when I pull up to my sister's house. Dad, she's screaming. Dad, you gotta tell me you love me, Dad. You gotta tell me you're proud of me, Dad. You've got to before you die, you have to. You've gotta tell me you love me, Dad. Tell me you're proud of me, what I've done, my work. So oldest brother, birth order, comes in. And I sit Carol in the living room, and I say, Carol, Dad is dying, he is not going deaf. <laughs> she said, Pat, I've got to hear him tell me he loves me. He's never told me in his life whether he loves me. He doesn't tell me he's proud of me, ever. Has he done it with you? I said, Carol, every day the phone rings at 6 o'clock. <laughs> Pat, I love you so much, my son. I'm so proud of you for what you have done with your life. And I only wish I could say the same thing for your sister. <laughs> I said, Carol, that is not Bill Cosby dying in that next room. That is the great Santini. He can't say these things, Carol. We need to translate for Dad. He does love us. And we need to be able to tell him that. Uh, we need to be able to read that from him. OK, I get it. So we walk back in, and my biggest nightmare comes to the door. My sister Kathy married the biggest redneck in South Carolina, Bobby Joe Harvey. I ain't gotta tell you people about rednecks. I hope we got a couple in here dragged by their wives, by their feet, <laughs> into their only cultural event of the year. But, Bobby Joe, I'm telling you, this guy is central casting. So Bobby Joe comes in, he's, he's got that shuffle, I love it. And he comes in by dad. Dad's going to be dead the next day. He comes in. He looks at dad. He and dad love each other. And he said, hey, old man. Hey, old man. How you doing, son? And my father says, I love you, Bobby Joe. <laughs> And my sister goes off like a Roman candle. <laughs> and the Conroy family is screaming at each other again. <laughs> when my mother died, I read poetry to her. 
for three days. Because I wanted, like tonight, we were brought together by a great wave of the English language. A language I think is more beautiful than any on earth. I wouldn't know because I don't speak any of the others. <laughs> but it's this wave of language that connects us, it bonds us. And especially as Southerners, especially as people who love the South, who live in the South, and it's been a great pleasure to be with you tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.